says live stream, but it takes a long time. <laughs> okay. So yes, let's begin. Welcome everyone to CBA's Spring 2022 Broadside Series reading called Betwixt. This is the second and last set of the two sessions curated by Alison Carter Bolle, um, poet and part of CBA community. Before we get started, we acknowledge that Center for Book Arts is on unceded territory of the Lenape people. We also have a few notes on accessibility before we get started. Um, live captions are ava available tonight. If you click on CC closed captions button at the bottom of the screen and select show subtitles. As I mentioned before, the event is being recorded and will be available to view online afterwards through our YouTube channel. If you don't wish to appear, you can rename yourself, keep your mic muted and turn your camera off. This reading is part of a series that has been going on for more than 20 years and it gives the opportunity to visual artists and poets to work together. We would like to thank our funders. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. We would also like to uh, thank poets and writers. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's amazing curator, Alison carter Bolle. Uh, she goes by she, they uh, pronouns. She's a printmaker, poet, teacher, and also administrative assistant at Center for Book Arts. Alison is from Calgary, Alberta, and holds a bachelor in science in biology with double major in English literature from the University of British Columbia. She is currently pursuing an MFA in poetry at Columbia University, where she was awarded the inaugural Max Ridvo Poetry Fellowship. You can find Allison in New York, either at the foot of a letterpress or waiting for the L train to take her to a letterpress. Welcome, Allison. Thank you so much, Camilo, and thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, I know some of you joined our last meeting and some of you are new, and regardless, I'm Truly honored to be presenting this installment of CBA's Broadside series. Um, and as Camilo said, this event is supported in part by some funders and our friends at Poets and Writers and through every Broadside sale and by donation. Um, I just remember today that you can, in fact, text Book Arts to a number if you want to make a small donation, um, if you are so inclined, and putting that in the chat now and calling that my housekeeping. So, um, I have a short statement that hopefully elucidates somewhat of how I got to the name Betwixt for this series and this being the second installment. Some of you will have already heard it. Um, apologies to those of you who have. Um, and ultimately this, this whole series was inspired by the alchemy that comes, that, that is a product of these broadside collaborations. So um, what else? Between exhibitions, the gallery is neutralized, stripped, spackled, and repainted for the next show's ordinance and for the one after that. The vessel returns, if approximately, to tear. I've watched my colleagues perform this ritual several times, aiming small tools, the vinyl punctuation marks, and wall text, packing artwork for transit, and unscrewing the shelves. When I was asked to curate this series, I rapidly discovered that I only have this, a peripheral knowledge of what it means to curate something. Most of what I know was learned through witnessing these labors of uncuration, the process of translating every pedestal back to zero, zero on the proverbial Cartesian plane. Translation is a tricky word. One valence thereof means to move a shape without distorting its form, no fingerprints and no trace. A translator's labor is often regarded not unlike those of the gallery workers whose tasks are defined in part by the assumption that their work should be invisible, should lie betwixt, caught in the door, undefined door jam between two otherwise well-furnished rooms. It seems to be a matter of sterility, concern for cross-contamination between one show and the next, as though the art space were an agar plate to be inoculated with those very specific, delicate strains one hopes to bloom, just so. Perhaps it goes without saying that poetry and art are unsterile to begin with, curation too, and certainly any manner of collaboration therein. 
The Broadside series at Center for Book Arts is a willful, exuberant foray into the unexpected outcome of two artists coming together. We are not looking for the Higgs boson and their collision, the buckshot remainder of two vectors at speed. Rather, I think we are looking for what can happen in the expansive, indefinable between, for the symptomatic flicker of two stars in orbit. Thus, this series is called Betwixt. My hope is that together we can delight in between, reside in the cleft. These broadside readings are magical because what remains on the tympan becomes a ghost print in the ear, becomes an echo of chant, patois, silence, and cacophony. I wanna thank all of the poets and the artists, both within and without this series. All of you have inspired me so much and I'm beyond grateful to have you here tonight. And thank you to the outstanding staff at Center for Book Arts who entrusted me with this series and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for being here. The first reader tonight is the poet Megan Sung Yoon. Megan Sung Yoon translates between languages and across genres. After graduating from the School of the Art, Art Institute of Chicago with a BFA thesis, installation of text, video, and sound, Sung Yoon moved to New York and earned an MFA in poetry and literary translation at Columbia University. Sung Yoon's work has appeared or is forthcoming in Copper Nickel, Asymptote, Sam Journal, The Margins, Hypertext Review, and Columbia Journal, where Sung Yoon served as the translation editor. Thank you so much. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you, Alyssa, for introducing me. Um, and before I begin, I also want to thank um, Alison and Center for Book Arts for inviting me to this wonderful event tonight. And I also want to thank Sohyeol for the conversations we had um, in preparation for this and, of course, for making cross sites. Um, and <clears throat> my work included in the series is entitled Alice, and it is a part of a collection of poems I made using an intentionally limited vocabulary. So while I read, um, you'll notice some words just repeat throughout the poems, and that wouldn't have been make much sense to begin with. Um, but so bear with me and my reading. <laughs> uh, here it goes. Alice. Indignation upon reaching adulthood. Her house, name, side. Name, sex. Name, goodbye. Unfairly, soon I say. Fortress. Citadel, walls, drive the rat, let go, O oh, border, let me, bye. Um, my next poem is entitled, Ah, Ah. A character and a word go emerging, measure us displeasure, walls come an edge, O oh, brink of a sage. From now capture Bluebird of a district, a good drive family noted for. The inner ministry of nest a child prayed under, against, and for. An atomic song the quarter crosses in A. Well, what I say, house. A restaurant, an ideograph, a received castle, brightness now rage in American English a department store, and the like all. There I sheath, I gender, I sought no, I as a beehive assume the end, as temporary leaves that last. Avenue. Atomic displeasure as an okay please. Center shine, the end of a beehive as prey against goodbye. Now, now a margin man, yes, tolerably could Tolerably Confucius under the name rule, name reaching a store. Then contemporary there, false per makeshift citadel, the specialist embolism limits a foot of letter, all assumed, all come, an ideograph in no word. Then, <clears throat> then place. From yes to please, an okay is a goodbye. Gooder, falser, pricer. Castle name approval, 
because the main person, Al as a major, what a sector, let us soon. A man housing against a comai, no cipher encasement, no referendum. Last yes, a collection prey, all adulthood embolism like a ministry of saint. Area phi area, say the provisional specialist I adjun listen. D, wrath tolerably province, a sub dwelling there. Burge, place. Let a child and shop the restaurant. As soon as a box, the limits come see. Like an office son, the arch crosses ya yeah, tentatively. Bye, then a quarter. Ah, uh, per specialist, a goodbye near province. The fortress name, the captured rat, and the assumed luster. All because the nest rule falls with great wrath. Wasps, wasps as their wasps house, wasps housing, a wasps place near the web wasps sea. Wasps in American song, wasps ministry rest, oh wasps rent with wasps as to the saint wasps now okay, the expedient wasps oh then, oh then, wasps crosses, rage box wasps in case, weller wasps listen, and pray wasps for wasps value. And um, the next two poems I'm gonna read are my most recent work and they are my translation of poems by Korean poet Kim Yu Rim. Uh, and there they go. Cow. Cow is dead. Not the cow you think of. From afar, the cow came. On a ship or on a plane, the cow grazing in a pasture across the Atlantic. Not because it sadly knows it's sad fate, just because it's far. Will moo moo cry. Not the cow you ate and not the cow you're going to eat. Not the cow that was a calf. A baby cow and a cow that's not a baby cow. A cow that can't be distinguished whether it is a baby cow or a cow that is not a baby cow. Oh, right there, the smoking ships arriving at the port. The cow wouldn't have come on one of those ships. Not sure, an unsure cow. An indistinguishable cow and a distinguishable cow. A cow that doesn't at least die for a special occasion and a cow that dies because of a special occasion and a cow that just dies and a cow that doesn't just die but is dying gradually. But the cow just died. You become someone suitable for a situation that is difficult to situate and slice the knife of fate. They say a fried tongue is a delicacy. On a pasture of a faraway country is a neighboring country's cliff where you can watch the pasture burn and even a cliff has a house but at night a smoking, sizzling, frying pen. And this will be my last poem. Um, I mean, my translation of someone else's poem, but my last piece of this reading. <laughs> dream of dream. Gone one comes back, but one went to look for the gone doesn't. Still, there's tree, and there's tree, there's tree, but there appears tree again. Though I want to stop, there's tree, and there's tree, though I want to stop. Tree doesn't stop standing where the workers hired by the city hall planted it. A street tree is a street tree, a tree is tree. There's tree, though people walk by without, without, with or without tree. Gone one comes back, and one who went to look for the gun, isn't it weird, does not come back. There, one makes oneself home, 
and speaks in another language. Still, there's tree, and there's tree, still. One there's tree, and on the streets of Seoul, where, where there's tree, walks lightning like this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. I'm going to share a PowerPoint and introduce the artist uh, that worked with Megan on this series. Um, so I'm gonna pin you, Soho. Um, so Megan Sun Yoon and Soho Bajia worked together on this broadside series and Sohil, Sohil Bhatia is an artist and homemaker currently based in Lenapa Hoking, now known as New York City. They received their MFA at the School of, the Art, School of Art at Carnegie Mellon University. Sohil's practice emerges from contemplations about the latencies of mundane objects, rituals, and images, bringing together the complexities of human existence and the body's relationship with time and the space it inhabits. Through the performative practice, so he explores and addresses paradoxes as well as represents unresolvable concepts and emotions. They utilize books as containers for preserving ephemera. So, so Hill, I will turn it over to you. Thanks for inter that introduction, Alison. Um, yeah, it was a very exciting process to be working with uh, Megan on like, and also there's just this text, this, I, I, I saw the poem and I was just like, okay, this is what we got to do. We, this is the one we're working with. There were so many to pick from. And then I remember I just like shortlisted three of them. Uh, and then we kind of decided to go with this one. Uh, there's something so special about having, uh, having worked with this text and and it was in a way also uh, interesting and difficult because the text is so much of the work and I felt like I had to just remove myself as much as possible from it uh, and and just let the the text kind of breathe and be on paper um, yeah I think the so I'll, the text was kind of the text is that it was printed on the paper and the it's actually not paper but um this polyester sort of really flimsy fabric -y, uh thing <laughs> that it's printed on uh and i think when i also i think of this text um megan i haven't said this to you either but i think of this text as something that's it's like a dream, but it's it's kind of also whispered. It's like al almost whispered to me, um, and and I'm kind of sitting with it. So I I I kind of confront the text in a very unexpected manner. I feel like every time I confront it, it feels unexpected, uh, and it's almost like text that I would find somewhere and sit with for a and a poem that I would sit with for um, just a while. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Soho. The next reader who we're going to introduce is Susan Howe. And if I have any of my former students in the audience, you'll know what an honor it is to, to have her here. So uh, Susan Howe's most recent Poetry selection was Concordance, published by New Directions in 2020, alongside a reissue of Spontaneous Particulars, Telepathy of Archives, a prose meditation on her research in various rare book collections. Her selected essays collected in the quarry were published in 2015 in a poetry collection, Depths 2017, won Canada's Griffin Award for Poetry in 2018. Thank you so much, Susan. And thank you, Alison. Okay, um, I'm going to read uh, for just um, sections from Concordance, my recent book, and I'm I'm mixing the sections without explanation. So uh, here goes. Okay. 
Whoops, I'm not used to reading on Zoom. Anyway, A, concordances, I may remark, are hunting down half-remembered worthy service. They contribute in a history of words, and so to the mind such assistance from them. And 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 fragments feed and shelter it. And when I was still another behest with it, nevertheless I endured it. Why? T, which gave us our body, takes it, bear it. I love it, says somebody, was just now saying, is it not net you, this very affection? But the says, let it go now and have with it. Always is a reader going on with little and great hops. I have your bags packed but might lose them. Many a young person now and then can wish to see how to go far, far off, out of reach, above all things below, not for mother of pearl, where names are set down in meaning and sense of promise, tangled with golden beads for stars, deposited with ancestors as trespass brought home. A crescent moon is hard to see, stitched apparently at random, but with finest knowledge. If you give to receive each transitory life, and this might mean that death is not so frightening, but a soaring sense of open sky, a mile off, distant at sea, worked with every sort of thread, even hair, when thread is too fine for whirling snow to press down over nights with veils of iambic lines and perfect quatrains so tiny, no margins, calling into doubt nominal subjects less religious than decorative before professional embroiderers aggressively slashing stitches said to be not for profit. Dwelling in trusted digital archives, only a few of us are instantly legible. As with the painted sun on the wall, you see the sun and stars. There's a difference between. Go to a ladder that leads to free air. All things serve when the psalm sings instead of the singer. Down at the heel, scullion of fate will never settle on something. When all is passing scurry and water shine changing, nothing remains but the beauty of this sheet of paper waving like a sail, scudding between phonemes and syllables, as if the wind has blown a flower of the field from Pangaea in Permian time, when earth was one continent with one Panthalassa ocean. Google again for the source of my quotation and I'll fetch you another governess related origin in grandmother glossolalia, kinesthetic, shadowy, defining other metaphoric surface embroideries, folding and fracturing, retracing convoluted needlework patterns. You don't get to where you think after extensive fieldwork, just for a chance to see Pangaea break apart in a, in a process that leads to the birth of the Atlantic Ocean 20 million years before the public is ready for twilight liberalism. Temples, amphitheaters, acres of gardens, artificial lakes and side doors, tears of blood, dissenters, dinosaurs, a world without America in it, rushing along the distance between now and then, possession and dispossession.
late poems tiptoeing on a philosophical threshold of separation, mourning for an irrevocable past, holding to memory the death of memory, condensed, condensed through concordance logic, lit, lit by a hidden terrain where deepest homonyms lie unpersuadable. My antinomasia. Names stand out in single isolation, not for what they say or for what seems to remain unsaid, stepping out as much as you like. Each slight verbal reference or connection gets lost, though found by some inherent sense of form in every respect but touch linking the always undiscovered country to all families on earth. There is no other way Eve, the unknowable author of life, will live to teach others, bruising the serpent's head from years of treading water under history. Ideas are her undercover. Only shells remain as placeholder, keeping her spiral self safe. Somewhere far off, she lays siege to your heart in spirit of the occult. As the setting into the work, as truth made to blend others. So that wrath is not the last thing. Knowing birth is identical with death. And even mercy seasonable in days of affliction. This has something to do with ecology, with what lies buried on the ocean floor. Shields and sails and ships cast down, eons before house and home, even before time as the roofed gateway in which a beer is placed before again disappearing. Hermit thrush. Sparrow, 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 starling, swallow, swallow, swallow. Thank you so much, Susan. The artist for whom Susan worked for this broadside series was Sarah Moody. Spotlight you and share this piece. So let me read Sarah's. Sarah Moody is an artist and letterpress printer focused on slow work, analog processes, and the digital divide. Through print and small publications, her work addresses communication, the delicate nature of language and technology, and how they intermingle. She earned an MFA in book arts and printmaking from the University of the Arts and a Bachelor of Art in Art History from Carleton College. She has previously assisted classes at Pratt Fine Arts Center and during the Summer Institute at Wells Book Arts Center, where she was also an artist in residence. Originally from Anchorage, she currently lives in New York City, where she is an apprentice with book art, uh, artist Russell Moret. Thank you so much. So... And Sarah. <laughs> well, um, first, I wanted to say I'm so lucky to have been paired with Sarah. I can't believe how she completely got my vibe right away. So I just am so thankful, Sarah, to what you've done. Well, the feeling is mutual. I was really <laughs> thrilled to be part of this series and specifically to be able to have the opportunity to work with you and to have a small hand in printing this broadside. So thank you as well. It's been <laughs> wonderful. Um, so, so yeah, when, uh, when I first learned of this, my first inclination, sorry, there's some noise in the background, uh, was to work with Susan. And it was uh, a unique opportunity because obviously it's already a visual. And so I was trying to figure out a way to, um, sorry. There's some construction happening. Okay. Um, I was trying to figure out a way to uh, 
add a little bit to the physicality of the poem without impacting the visual that Susan already had. And so I had been looking a little bit at the work of um, Sylvia Plymouth Mangold, whose work is on the right. And she has this wonderful way of drawing attention to the ordinary and specifically making the ordinary a little bit complicated. And so when I saw Susan's work, um, it's such a different experience to view the physical object than it is to see the printed work. And so my first, I, my first thought was, oh, I need to print the tape. Let's print the tape. And so, um, so that other image on the left was um, lightly tracing the actual paste up that Susan had made in order to not make my own version of the drawing, but to actually copy what Susan had already placed on the paper. Um, and so in the next slide, you can see that translated into a polymer plate um, along with the title of the work, which is title. And then uh, the next slide shows um, me setting a very long line of eight point type for the colophon. Um, and finally, you can see the broadside uh, result. And so it, I felt like it was successful because um, to me, it's still purely Susan's work. I just gave it a different vantage point for this project. Um, and it's been, as I said, a total joy to work on. So uh, thank you to Allison and to Center for Book Arts and specifically to Susan for um, making this all happen. It's been really great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yeah, it's been really amazing seeing seeing all these come together and the the diligence with which you approached this was just couldn't couldn't ask for a, what's a better combination it would seem. So our final reader of the evening is none other than Matthew Dix. Matthew, I'm going to in you. <laughs> Uh, Matthew is a writer from South Carolina. He studied poetry at the College of Charleston and Columbia University, where he served as the poetry editor of Columbia Journal. He has two poems in the current issue of Fence, and I will give it over to you, Matthew. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to do two things first. I'm going to turn off all of you and make the screen black so I'm not distracted. So if you catch a glimpse of my night guard or anything, keep that to yourself. I don't wanna hear about it. Um, secondly, I'm so grateful to be here today. Thank you, Allison, so much for inviting me. This is like obviously such an intense honor. Um, I've never been offered the position of following up to Susan Howe before. And um, I don't know how I feel about it. That was a beautiful reading, but I'm a little bit um, <laughs> overwhelmed by what's to come or maybe underwhelmed is the better word for it. Um, but it's been such an incredible experience working on this. Working with Ronnie on the broad side has been incredible. Um, I've never had the opportunity to truly like enter a co-creative space with another artist when it comes to my work. And that was such an incredible experience. Um, and, and yeah, without any further ado, I'm gonna set a timer and I'm gonna start reading. I'm gonna start off with the, um, with the title poem from the broad side. And I think I'm going to finish with that one too, just because it's easy to forget. Um, and it's called Dear Lord. Lots of these are about God. In a cheeky way, I hope. Okay. Dear Lord, I hate the people I love the most. I am ugly. I have learned to read in a few languages. Despite my reason, I am afraid of nuclear war. I am existential when it comes to philosophy, politics, poetry. I am afraid of becoming a spook. This is the part of the poem where I could comment on the natural landscape and I have learned to live happily with the ghost. Put that aside. Okay, so this one and many of my poems contain what is uh, casually referred to as the F slur, so. Just be advised, I write a lot about, you know, God and fags, which I think is a great way to celebrate the second day of um, Corporate Pride Month. So here we go. All right, this one's actually um, one of the poems that's in the current issue of Fence, and it's called Faggot Balls in Love, which I wrote, unfortunately, about a straight man um, who I just saw two weekends ago. Anyway, Faggot Falls in Love, 
It was recently confirmed, as I had long suspected, that sex is only coincidentally pleasurable. We start with an ending. I dreamt of orange when I was six. I saw my father's ghost the first time when I was 13. He died and today he lives delivering organs to unknown bodies. We text occasionally. When I'm alone, I like to piss with the door open in the sink. I forgot to mention my father lives far away as a frozen zygote in a place called Colorado. I end the decade with another picture of my asshole. Some nights I am so happy ghosts exist, I threaten to cry. Some things which have happened here, I prefer to ignore, but there is something else here. I can see it in my face or in the window just behind me. I doubt it is important to hide my love for you, which you may have suspected a year or so from now. This felt urgent. In a world of certain news, prediction is capital. We live too close. We are far away. There is a certain catholicity in this exclusion and I hate you. Can you feel it? Okay. All right. So, you know, I flagged this one, but I might come back to it. I'm gonna need a different one first. Okay, this one is called um, No More Dying, which is safe from both um, the F word and mentions of God, I think. It, it shows up everywhere, frankly. Okay, No More Dying. Everything was exactly as it had been in the 14th century, when we knew the way forward was also the way back. The devil knocks on the door holding a pair of pink peonies. The devil knocks on the door. In the house, we imagine the moment. Inside the house is a ghost of the speaker. How long have you been here? We ask as a rhetorical device, because we know already. I have been here since February, 2018. The sky was white, like the house. All of the light was in the sky. And were there bunnies strewn about the path? Yes, there were. Their lovemaking littered the sidewalks. And the graves? They marked the time. Where did this happen? It happened in Charleston, in New York, in Paris, where I've never been. When I enter the house, I am waiting for myself. I've been waiting for you, I say. I know, I say, I'm sorry, I say back, but I don't respond. I am already gone and we close the door behind us. Okay, so that one had the devil in it, which is kind of like God. Um, so I apologize for the divinity. But we forge on. This one's called Angels and Demons. So there's a theme as you can see. All right, angels and demons. I dreamed I was the 14th century. There was a terrible market crash. No one could buy fuel for their hover cars. Garbage flooded the streets. The earth flew too close to the sun. Everyone's shoulders broke out in blisters. Snakes descended from the banks. Joggers always discovered the bodies. Once a year, all the food died. People learned to make do. Beautiful flowers changed color. One night, the moon spilled blood. In the year 1399, I departed for the future. The villagers threw a great party to toast my return. We wore giant reflective costumes to shield our skin from the sun. Near the end when we embraced, my face began to burn. Okay, those are kind of long. I'm gonna read a couple short ones. Okay. All right. This one's called, Faggot Falls in Love with the God of War. Flowers, doggies, trees, the grass, Euclidean planes, clocks and other apparatuses for measuring time, the sounds of birds, the humble plumage of the female, I saw you in all of it, even when I tried to see only myself. Okay. 
Let's do one more short one before I move on to a longer one. Okay, this one's called the 144,000. Um, there's this idea in certain Christian sects that only 144,000 people are going to make it to paradise, which is not my belief, but it is the title of this poem. All right. Me and all my friends are called the 144,000. We don't eat meat on Fridays, and that night we all bought them. The Holy Spirit enters us, and we partake in a sacred covenant. Our husbands are ashamed to be laborers. We drip in the sublime semen of God and run rub unctions into our skins. Okay. That one's a little gross, to be honest. Okay, I'm going to read one longish one, I think, and then wrap around to reread that broadside poem. Okay. This one is called God, My Darling. God, my darling, no one is comforted that first comes the flash of light. I can no longer bear the reality of metaphor. I can no longer make it to the grocery store. Maybe I'll move upstate like writers do. Maybe I'll email my landlord again. I can no longer control the urge to curse. Maybe I'll learn the name for the bird singing outside my window who stops when I open it. I can no longer remember. Poetry, you are deceitful. I can no longer bear it. God, why am I envious of my friends? Why did I feel faint walking home from the grocery store? Why is it painful to be intelligent? Why is it painful to endure the stupidity of rich people? Why are my friends envious of me? Why are my friends rich? Does my mother love me and my, and my father? Why do parents die silently? And the earth, I remember. It's an American Robin. What about the other stuff? Why do I envy my friends? Poetry, you have deceived me. I can no longer resist the urge to speak. And why do we sing? Okay, at the risk of being a glutton, I'm gonna read two short ones and then I'll end it. Okay, this is called Last Night I Had a Fight. Last night I had a fight with myself in the desert. 40 days and nights I'd been in the cat tree of my mind, swinging pendulously, looking quite stupid like that, or so I imagine. And then I'll do this last one, which is called the literal moon. At the lecture by the very beautiful man I learned that twinks don't remember Judy Garland, but we do remember Paris, how it feels to be spurned, the shine on the apple and the other's palm, pearls and dew, an orbit of the sun. Okay, and before we turn it over to Ronnie, I'm just gonna read the broadside again. Dear Lord, I hate the people I love the most. I am ugly. I have learned to read in a few languages. Despite my reason, I am afraid of nuclear war. I'm existential when it comes to philosophy, politics, poetry. I am afraid of becoming a spook. This is the part of the poem where I could comment on the natural landscape and I have learned happily to live with the ghost. Thank you so much, Matthew. It's so a bit of easy. Um, so as Matthew mentioned, we worked with Ronnie, who I'm going to pin. Uh, and I will introduce. Yes, repetition is a bit of a through line. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> um, so Ronnie, also one of our artists in residence and is a New York based visual artist whose practice is at the intersection of photography, text, drawing and installation. In her work, which has been published and exhibited internationally, Aviv explores emotional residue through repetition and material change. 
She photographs different types of mark, making, mark makings performed onto paper using soaking, grinding, and tracing techniques. This is a practice of a visual and psychological inquiry into experiences and services that are ubiquitous in everyday life and therefore often overlooked. Thank you so much, Ronnie. I'll turn it over to you. Hello. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matthew. Oh, I can't see myself all of a sudden, which is kind of awkward, but I'll deal with that. Um, so, uh, Matthew had me at, um, I hate the people I love the most. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, that was enough for me. And also the comment about the landscape as I have a weird, um, well, not even love hate, just like hate relationship to poems that are too landscapey, maybe because I don't get them. Um, but I really enjoy this anxious, honest, awkward energy that we share sometimes. Maybe you do it just more um, elegantly. Um, yeah, and it was really, really cool to work together. I think that um, the two other writers that obviously really uh, resonated with me also because my own practice was Susan and Megan, but working with Matthew because of the way that the poems were not constructed already into a visual um, actually gave a lot of room for interpretation and exploration. Um, which was all with collaboration with Matthew. Um, and basically I'll just really briefly explain, um, everything is um, hand set similarly to Tsoil's um, typesetting. Um, there was three layers here. The first layer is pressure printed. Uh, Matthew and I made um, uh, a plate, which is basically a piece of paper where we glued our hair into the plate um, and then ran that through the press behind the paper. Um, and while I was doing that, I like to incorporate other mark makings into the plate, kind of making it into a monotype. Um, on top of that, there was the text. And on top of that, um, schmears of gold that sometimes I added in the very end and sometimes in the first round. Um, yeah, and then I made Matthew write, uh, handwrite on every single one of them variable because I thought that would be a nice addition. Um, yeah, so this is a variable addition. Each one is different. I think in this one, you can see the hair nicely kind of in the middle. Um, and it was a great joy to do this. It was really, really fun. Um, it was a great joy. And with the hair, I, I am so obsessed with the fact that both of our hair commingles in these prints. I just need to say that when I came in to like deliver my hair, I was going about it in totally the wrong way. Ronnie already had like a small bag collected and I just started, I just took my hair down and started grabbing little <laughs> small little pieces out of my hair. It looked quite strange, but um, I think it still looks quite strange in a very beautiful way that is haunting. Uh, in a way that I think was kind of um, like very complimentary for the text. It was so cool to meet Ronnie and to, to work with you. It was really, um, it's gonna be a cherished memory for a long time. It's been an honor. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie and Matthew. Um, that does conclude our program of speakers, uh, but I did want to just open the floor briefly to all of our poets and artists. If there's anything you wanna add about this collaborative process, I mean, much like Matthew and Ronnie were just sharing, um, that's truly the magic of this. It's, it's what I found so inspiring and, and it has been my delight to see all of this come together and, and see the fruits of that. And I wonder if anyone else wants to share an experience from this or a thought before we close it out for the evening. If not, that's excellent. Um, the, there are two last little things before I let everyone go. 
Um, one is that Camilo has given me permission to announce before it is announced formally that Megan Sung Yoon, our first reader of the evening, is the chapbook contest runner up for this year. So uh, congratulations to Megan. And uh, finally, all of these broadsides are still available. Of course, they're all editioned, variable editions. Um, I'm gonna send out a link to everyone who's here tonight and who was here during the first reading where you can get broadside if you haven't picked one up already or are inspired uh, having heard these artists and poets talk about the work that went into them. And that's all for this whole series. Thank you everyone so much for coming and for supporting this and for reading, for committing all this time and making these beautiful designs and printing them. It's been wonderful. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Allison. And thank you, CBA. <laughs> thank you, Allison. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Johnson. <clears throat> thank you. Okay. I'm gonna... Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>